Good morning, good morning, good morning, everyone. How are you? How are you? I trust that everyone had an exciting Juneteenth yes. weekend celebration. I know I did. It was really great to see all of the things that were there. But we're going to go ahead and get it get started this morning with Lubbock Metropolitan Planning Organization. I'm calling the meeting to order at 8.31 a.m. All righty. I believe... I almost missed you over there, Steve. You were pulling a Sheila by being ducked down behind that, that monitor. <laughs> so we do have a quorum, uh, so we'll proceed. I just uh, ask that those who have a copy of our packet this morning kind of take a look at the safety procedures so that we don't uh, spend time there so that we can get forward, go forward with our procedures uh, and presentations. Uh, public comment period. Did we have anyone to sign up? come running and signing up this morning? We did not. But I will say that there, we do have an actual guest this morning. <laughs> we do, and we have the principal of Richard Milbourne Academy, Ms. Taffany uh, uh, White, and she is following me around for a few days. So uh, she's pretty sharp, so it may end up that I end up following her around while she's here this week. So we want to welcome her. She's excited to be here. She has her packet and ready. I uh, hope you had an opportunity to look at the minutes from last meeting on May 16th. If we can move forward with a motion. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. All righty then. We're already moving. We're going to go to item number six. And I believe we have some... Mr. Martin is going to introduce our special guest for today for a presentation. Mr. Martin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We have the opportunity to hear from It's good to have, oh, there you go, there you go. I'll start over. We're, uh, we're privileged to have TxDOT here to be able to give us a presentation on the State Infrastructure Bank Program and to be able to discuss advantageous uh, loan processing for those transportation infrastructure projects for public entities as well as private entities that are contracted through a public contract. We have Dallas Teston here from TxDOT, and he'll go ahead and move forward with this presentation. All right. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you all for uh, taking the time to uh, give me some time to give you some information on our program. As you mentioned, my name is Dallas Teston. Uh, I work for TxDOT out of our Austin office. Uh, I work on a team that runs the State Infrastructure Bank program. Uh, so today I'm going to give you all a little bit of background of the program, um, kind of some of the advantages of using it, uh, what it might cost you, and the, uh, the timeline for obtaining a loan. Um, the one thing that I do want you all to take away from it, because um, it's going to be a lot of information, is uh, just remembering that the CIV is out there as an option for your communities, and it's a low-cost transportation financing program. Uh, just starting off, a little bit of background on the program. So the program is a revolving fund, so all of our repayments go back into the program so it grows over time so we can get more projects done. Um, one thing I like to mention up front, uh, we're using non-federal dollars, so using the SIB won't federalize your projects. Um, there aren't any additional federal regulations that, uh, that trigger by using the SIB itself. Some stats on the program, we've done 149 loans. They've ranged anywhere from 10,000 to 42 million. Uh, our median loan amount is about a million dollars, uh, so one to five million is kind of the, the space that a lot of our loans come in. We've done 728 million loans to date, and we've used that to leverage to get done about eight billion dollars in projects across the state. 
so who typically borrows from us? Uh, cities and counties like yourself are our typical borrower. So about 75% of loans have gone directly to cities or counties. Uh, about 5% have also used their economic development corporations. So um, 4B sales tax, I think, is one of the common ones. But uh, really, any anything that you're allowed to pledge to debt um, that can be used for a transportation project through this program. So kind of visually, what does that look like? Um, so a, a lot of our loans have gone, obviously, to the urban areas up and down the I-35 corridor. Uh, we have done some out in this West Texas area. Um, you know, and kind of the reason that I want to come to speak to you today is just that, so that y'all know that is, um, there is opportunity to use it out in this area. Uh, so I want to make sure that your communities know that it is an option available to you all. Uh, <clears throat> so highlighting a couple of the ones that we have done. So the city of Lubbock actually has done a loan with us back in 2018 uh, for the Loop 88 project, uh, kind of the most recent one. Also the city of Leveland did a, a small loan with for the US 385 project. Uh, a couple older ones, Hall and Motley County for some off-system bridge work, uh, some smaller loans back in the 90s. So jumping into kind of the nuts and bolts of the program on eligibility, um, I'm going to start on the right-hand side with the eligible uses. Uh, my, my normal PowerPoint has some animation here that starts there, but um, so eligible, eligible uses. So any costs associated with the construction or reconstruction of the roadway. Uh, so once we determine the project is eligible, really any costs associated with that project are eligible for the, uh, to use a SIB for. Um, so obviously labor and materials on the roadway itself, but if there are any ancillary uses, um, I know sometimes there's landscaping, median work, uh, bike lanes, sidewalks, things like that can also be included in the loan amount. Uh, a big one right now is contingency. So with rising inflation, labor costs, uh, we're encouraging all of our borrowers to include contingency in the loans. Um, if you don't use it, once the project's complete, you'll just return it to pay down the balance. Um, but if you know there are overages in, within the, uh, the project itself, we'll have to go back through the entire process. Uh, Right-of-way acquisition, utility relocations, two common uses. Um, <clears throat> so local matches. So a lot of new programs coming out through IAJA, a lot of them require local matches through local governments, um, or if you have any projects that are using federal funds that require a local match, you can borrow from the SIP for that. And then financial and legal fees that you incurred throughout the, the loan process as well. So jumping back over to the left side with the eligible projects. Um, so we're not using federal dollars, but um, we are in partnership with FHWA and we're authorized under a federal statute. So any roadways have to be eligible under federal highway programs. Uh, so they have to be functionally classified above a rural minor collector. Uh, and I'll give a little more detailed example of that in a second. Uh, one of the things I like to note is that that does not necessarily mean it has to be on the state highway system. So there is opportunity to use it on off-system roadways in your area, especially in more urban areas. And then generally, any project eligible under Title 23. So as I mentioned, any of those um, kind of IJA programs coming out, or um, really any program under 23, and then some under 49 as well, you can use a SIP for. Uh, so here's kind of a snapshot over the city of Lubbock, uh, the orange being the on-system roadways. Uh, the green, orange, or green, purple, and yellow roads are off-system roadways that could potentially be eligible for SIP financing. Um, so not to really go into the detail of the roads themselves, but this is just kind of giving a sap snapshot that there um, could be some opportunity in your area uh, to use the SIB um, outside of, uh, you know, on-system roadways. Uh, our program definitely wants to be available to make sure we're assisting in any um, obligations for tech stop projects, but um, once again, just kind of giving you an idea of what the SIB could be used for. Uh, so why use our program? What are some of the advantages of it? As I mentioned, we're, um, we like to consider ourselves a low-cost borrowing program. So we don't charge any fees for applying, no fees for loan handling. Uh, we handle everything within TxDOT, um, everything from the loan application to uh, execution to the servicing of the loan is all done within one division in Austin. Uh, the bulk of our loans are done through a direct loan agreement. So the debt instrument uh, is authorized within statute for your communities to borrow directly from TxDOT. Uh, we can be the purchaser of a CO or a bond if that's what your community prefers, but the uh, large bulk of our loans are done through that uh, direct loan agreement. Um, it's usually quicker and a little more cost effective. Uh, repayment terms, so you can uh, prepay at any time without penalty, so it's callable. Uh, so if you issue refunding bonds or have excess revenues and want to pay down debt, you can do that at any time. Uh, jumping to the interest rate, so we set the rate at the time of application. Um, it's a fixed rate throughout the life of the loan, so you'll know exactly how much it's going to cost up front. 
And as an example, so this is for a double A rated borrower, which I believe the city of Lubbock is. Um, as you can see, it's a sliding scale. The longer you go out, the more it'll tick up a little bit. Uh, it looks a little bit weird right now. The five year is supposed to be cheaper than the 10 year, but uh, interest rates are have a mind of their own. Um, so, you know, but starting at the 10 year, it, if you tick up a little bit um, as the farther you go out, uh, if your community, conversely, if we were doing, looking at like a 10 year, it would go down or the rate would go up the lower the credit rating was. So um, we don't require a credit rating to borrow, uh, but obviously there's an advantage to having one. And I will mention these, uh, these rates update weekly. Um, there's not a lot of movement week to week, but um, this is just kind of a snapshot of what they are right now at the end of May. So jumping into the process, um, my elevator pitch on this is it's about a four to six month process. <clears throat> so it'll start with your uh, local governing body, city council, commissioner's court, authorizing the application. You'll submit that to us. Um, it takes about uh, two to three months to get through our commission approval process. Uh, so once we receive that application, we have to go through commission approval. If there is a required environmental component to this, we'll have to have that approval before we can go to our commission. Um, so if there's other federal or state money on it, it requires a clearance, we'll have to have that before the commission can approve it. Um, otherwise, once we get through that commission approval, it's about 30 to 45 days to close after that. Uh, TxDOT will draft that agreement, provide it to you and your advisors for review or comment. It'll go back to your local governing body to authorize the execution, and then we'll disperse the funds shortly after that. Uh, so with that, that was a lot of information. Um, just some key takeaways, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, just keep us in mind. It's a low-cost transportation financing tool that's available to help you get projects done. On or off-system roads can be eligible. Uh, we fix the rate at the time of application. Uh, it's about a four to six month process, um, and we have to go through our transportation commission for every single loan. And with that, that's my direct contact information. Um, on our website, we have um, instructions on how to kind of check the eligibility if you want to yourself. So that map I showed is our statewide planning map on the TxDOT website, um, and we kind of give detailed instructions on how you can zoom in and, um, and look what roads might be eligible. We also have some one-page flyers on there as well. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that came up during that. Thank you, Mr. Tessa. Can we go back for me before I go to anyone else to page seven? I believe that is the off system map. <clears throat> and so uh, what you're saying is each of those types of roadways can be can utilize uh, the, the bank fund. Correct. So if it's functionally classified above a rural minor collector, which uh, every road lit up on this map is, um, it is eligible for federal funding and, and hence eligible to use the SIP for. Okay. Thank you. I was just looking at some location. Sure. Just yeah. I guess that brown is the orange. Yes. <laughs> and then um, just a, uh, is Broadway orange? Uh, is Broadway an on-system road? Okay, then it, it would be. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Any questions? Any comments? Hearing none. Thank you, Mr. Tesson. I appreciate you coming in. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to clarify something. Dallas said every road on this map is eligible. Those light gray ones are not. Okay. Those are the Correct. local roads. So just the ones that are listed in the ledger? Right. Okay. So color. Yep. Yes. Uh, yep. <laughs> so the light gray ones are, are local roads, and they would not be eligible for SIP financing. Any other questions or comments? Thank you so much again. All right. Thank you all. All right, we're moving to item number seven. We're going to discuss and take action, appropriate action regarding resolution 2023. I believe we're, is Holly going to be doing this or are you going to be doing this, Mr. Martin? I'll go ahead and, and make a presentation here. If uh, there's some questions and some additional information, we do have text dot individuals here that might be able to shed some more additional light if needed. Um, this agenda item is going to take action, or we're looking to discuss and take action on the annual listing of obligated projects. 
uh, for the 2020, uh, and this is resolution 202309, which discusses fiscal year 2022. Underneath the current transportation uh, bill, uh, the IIJ, we are obligated to annually um, bring forward a listing of projects that were obligated or received federal obligation to the committee and ask for, uh, for them to go ahead and approve uh, those listings. Underneath there, we work in conjunction with TxDOT to be able to go ahead and work within their framework. They actually produced this report on our behalf, but we work with them to confirm that all the projects listed in there have the correct description, MPL ID, MPL number, uh, and name, and project description. Within there, the TIP serves as the basis of that starting point. However, it may be a little bit different. The reason being is that the TIP uh, takes a look at projects and we list the projects based off of the anticipated uh, project uh, initiation. The ALOP is the actual uh, federal opportunity for them to be able to see how projects are progressing. And so it's done at the end of the year and not at the beginning of the year to be able to see how many projects were actually received federal authorization to move forward. And so that's the federal authorization is the binding agreement between the federal government for the federal portion that they are promising that they will repay or pay their portion of that project cost. And so underneath there, this is their accounting uh, ability to be able to say how many of the projects that are listed within a certain listing receive their authorization to move forward. And so it's always on the end of the fiscal year and not the beginning. And so there might be a change or there might be a difference within the total amount that was listed underneath the tip and the actual obligated amount. There are also uh, opportunities to de-obligate funding. So if a project had received a larger amount of funding and it came under cost and there was cost savings and there was a federal portion attributed to that cost savings, the federal government would de-obligate that federal amount. And so then they would be relisted underneath this annual listing of obligations as a de-obligation of the project. And so in short, um, for the FY22, there's a total amount of $70,919,000,000, uh, or $70,919,853 in federal funds that were obligated on all transportation projects across the entire multimodal transportation network. There is about $28 million in the highway projects within the MPO boundary and about $43 million in transit-related projects. And so there is a breakdown on page 22 of all those listings. And so I stand here to be able to ask uh, you to be able to do a review. The MPO has uh, taken a look at that and has worked with TxDOT, and we are in agreement on this listing. And then to be able to then take action to be able to approve resolution 2023-09. And I can stand here for any questions if you have any. Thank you. Are there any questions or comments this morning regarding this? If none, I'll call for a motion for to approve this report and resolution. Move for approval. Second. All those in favor? Show the sign by of I by, by voting by sign of I. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Thank you so much. Item number eight. On item number eight. So item number eight is a uh, resolution 2023-10, authorizing amendment number two to the 2023. 2026 Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, this is actually in conjunction with TxDOT and we'll be um, turning some time over to TxDOT to be able to make a presentation on this. But in short, this is an opportunity for us to be able to kind of take care of some housekeeping, to be able to get a, an amendment in place to be able to fund uh, the South Loop 88, as well as trying to get ahead of the upcoming August uh, STIP amendment that will be coming in and to be able to do a uh, 
to be able to do the TIP amendment to be able to upload those changes for the August call. The reason why we're trying to do this ahead of time is because we've already uh, canceled the, tr uh, the transportation alternative or the transportation advisory committee meeting for July in order to make sure that this is in place for that August call, we have to be able to do it now um, so that way we can go ahead and move forward. The other reason why we're trying to move forward with this is because TxDOT is anticipating one of the largest um, oh, UTP in their history as well as the LET in August is going to be uh, of significant proportions. And so we're trying to make sure that we help accommodate all those motions that they need to be able to then move forward and have everything in place so that way we can receive this additional funding that they uh, will be providing in August. And so I'm going to go ahead and turn over the time to be able to, uh, to Kylan uh, to be able to discuss this 10-year plan from TxDOT as well as the upcoming STIP amendment. Good morning. Good morning, Ms. Valley. How are you? Good. Um, so we did receive funding. Um, it's been preliminarily approved by um, our UTP group. It won't be actually authorized until August at the commission meeting, but we did receive funding for Loop 88, 3C, and 3D, which is part of what this has, um, a part of it. So we did get, um, we, we got 23,377,713 of CAT 12 funding, so that's commission funding on 3C. We also, as an MPO, utilize the rest of our funds for CAT 2 and CAT 4 um, to fully fund 3C at $285 million. And so part of that also includes CAT 1, which is district money, too, on that. And then on 3D, we got an extra $36.9 million of CAT 12 funding. Um, and that's a project that already, they both already previously had some commission funding to it. And so that just is exciting. They want to go ahead and help us fully fund these projects. Um, and, but on 3D, we are about 25 million short. And so it is not fully funded at this time, but it's just an acknowledgement that the commission is giving us that funding um, for 3D also. The other thing I wanted to discuss on 3C, so we had to put about $64 million of CAT 1, which is preventive maintenance money for the district. And generally, our budget is about $60 million a year. <laughs> and so we'd be spending all of our district's money on this one project. Um, and so I would request if we could get some CAT 9 funding, which is transportation alternative. Um, it's for the shared use path, the sidewalks, the curb ramps, illumination. Uh, of 5.7 million to help reduce that below the 60 million dollar mark for the district. Um, that's also a part of this um, request in the agenda item. And pretty much like Martin said, the reason we're doing this is because we had already um, canceled our July meeting at this point, um, and we just got this information from the administration, the UTP group in Austin, that we actually got this funding, and they're pushing each MPO to actually get all of these projects on the August revision. So there is an opportunity for the 3C, because it's fully funded, to actually let early. Right now, we're sitting in FY27, but as other districts move projects out because they're not clear for one reason or another, this could get pushed in. And so they need the August revision, this to be this project to be inside the STIP with the August revision. That way we have a chance of letting anywhere from November on. Um, usually the lightest months in our statewide letting are December, January, February, that time frame. And so they really want to have projects ready and available that we can move forward. So Steve and I, we're excited about the opportunity that we might actually get this project let in the next year, but part of that process is the STIP, because it, it was in 27, and 27 didn't roll into the STIP until 24, so this is coming September. So we've got to get it in so it can actually be accelerated. Any questions? Any questions, anyone? I, um, Madam Chair. Yeah. Mr. Warren? <coughs> Um, Colin's exactly right. This is a very exciting 
opportunity for the, the MPO area to, uh, <clears throat> we could accelerate this as early as January of this next year. Uh, got the right of way clear, utilities are being moved right now, plans are done, all we were waiting on is funding. Um, very fortunate that we were able to get that full funding for 3C. <clears throat> I have a question yes. for Kyla. On 3D, you're showing federal funds to be 228.066 million. That's the exact same number as 3C. Is that a, an error? Where are you seeing that? In 3C. On 3D, under federal funding? The total cost, estimated cost of 3D is $140 million. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's why I was like, I don't know what you're looking at. <laughs> I'm looking at this. Oh, yes. So that is, yeah, I need to fix that because that's not right. I didn't fix the... Yeah, I didn't fix those. I fixed the actual amounts across on the type of money, the categories. And Tammy already marked it that I needed to fix that. So I just want to make sure we get that cleared up before. Yes. We yeah, the number is actually in the agenda item, and those are correct, and in the resolution. Okay. The resolution has it correct. Yes. Yeah. That was my only, <coughs> excuse me, comments. Here. Thank you, Mr. Warren. Anyone else? And I'm, I'm just going to ask this uh, kind of crazy question. How much time could this potentially cut off on the completion of this project, given that maybe the same thing happens on the next phase? How much time? Mm -hmm. Like, you're saying, because this will be letting early. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if, if it were to let and then we move forward and do the work, I think Mr. Moore said, potentially beginning in January. That's when it would let. That's it would take bids in January. Okay. In but January. So that's, probably that's, April would be your earliest <clears throat> construction start date. That's actually moving that letting up three years from yes. where it was scheduled. So, so it'll save that much time at least. Wow. That's a lot of time. It is. And honestly, it will could possibly save us money too because this $285 million is at the inflated cost of 27. So you think about that, that could save us millions of dollars by letting it early, and then we can use that money on 3D. So um, it, it will benefit us overall if we could let it early. But. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? If not, I'd entertain a motion to approve resolution 2023-10, please. So moved. Second. Have a motion and a second. All those in favor? So a sign of aye. aye. Those opposed, same sign. Thank you. All righty. We are now to item number nine, I believe. Yes. Discussion and take appropriate action regarding the analysis and application of 23 USC 134 E2B. I think this is just kind of, this is a follow up from the. Um, other item we visited on last month, am I correct? This is a follow-up to the May discussion. <clears throat> Sorry, there we go. This is a follow-up to the discussion that we had in May concerning the requirements that we have for uh, reviewing uh, after a decennial census, the boundary, and the opportunity that we had after the policy committee uh, gave us permission to be able to move forward and to be able to do the analysis. And so we have completed that analysis, and this is uh, our opportunity to be able to come back to you to be able to say, we've completed the analysis, this is the analysis, and now we would like to request an opportunity to move forward with the public participation process underneath uh, the bylaws and re regulations that we have laid out. And so uh, we're going to go ahead, and today I will make a presentation concerning what we've been able to find out, uh, some of the information we've been able to gather, and then to be able to um, help uh, present some of the information that was also in direction that was given by the Transportation uh, Advisory Committee last month. So the first regulation, um, and this is the uh, 23 CFR 450 uh, 312I, it basically states that um, 
the, after an MPO, after each census, must be redetermine uh, their boundaries. And so this is just where that code is. This is what we presented to you in May. And it's just an indication there that we need to be able to take a look at the boundaries and be able to come up with a planning process that makes sense. What uh, Underneath that uh, review of what we had for the planning boundary, we took a look at 23 U.S. Uh, code E, and under number two, it indicates there that we have to do the 20-year planning horizon and that the MPO may take in the entire metropolitan statistical area or the consolidated area, as, as we had indicated before. Last time, we had indicated um, there before that this was an option. However, I wanted to bring back this code uh, so that way I could go ahead and point back that that's the reason why we took a look at the larger area. Underneath there, uh, we did take a look at the urban area. If you take a look at the screen there, um, everything that is a jigsaw yellow shape um, was considered to be an urban area underneath the census. Based off of that, we were required then to be able to smooth out that area. And so we had three urban areas within our uh, census uh, requirement. And so the green one is the Lubbock urban area. And the proposed smoothing of that is the green format. To the northwest is the Slayton, uh, or sorry, the shallow water urbanized area, and that's the purple is the proposed smoothing area based off the requirements, and then the Slayton area is down to the southeast, and you see another purple uh, urbanized area adjustment. And so those are all the smooth boundaries that we were uh, proposing to be able to submit to the state for their review. And then based off of that, um, here's the rules. And so those were the rules that we had discussed last time. As we went forward, though, uh, we took a look at the MPA. As, um, as we indicated, this is our current MPA in the metropolitan statistical area is in red there. So it's three counties. And that's based off of the uh, metropolitan uh, designations, based off the uh, federal designations for those areas. And when you zoom in, the combined statistical area, as you remember, is the five counties there. And as you take a look at those five counties, uh, I wanted to actually bring in and bring your attention to the west. As we take a look there, um, we called our partners, our planning partners in New Mexico, and called in District 5 and District 2 of New Mexico and to be able to have a discussion with them. And the discussion was, um, what are your plans for Clovis and Portales as well as Hobbs? Um, last census, when we discussed this with them, they thought those, two, those three communities were actually going to become their own MPOs. And Hobbs fell short by under 1,000, and Clovis was just about 1,200 individuals short. And so then the next question came in, well, if you were thinking that there were going to be an MPO, what was the thought process about your planning area and your planning boundary? And the Clovis and Hobbs are, uh, MPOs were actually uh, looking at not only their counties, but moving eastward into Texas. And there's precedent based off of that. If, you, if we want to take a look at the larger map, as you take a look at El Paso, El Paso actually did this uh, about three sentences ago, and they moved into New Mexico. And they ended up expanding their MPO boundary into New Mexico, and they do coordination with New Mexico. And this last census, they actually butt up now with Las Cruces. And there's coordination between the Las Cruces MPO as well as the El Paso MPO. And so with that, New Mexico was uh, under consideration as if they would have became an MPO, they would have been going east into Texas to be able to take in some of the neighboring counties. And we'll have some conversation about that here in this thought process as we walk through. But I just wanted to give you that information. So we did contact our neighboring DOTs. Based off of that, um, recently, you recently in April received an update on the travel demand model. So we utilized that travel demand model to take a look at travel patterns within the MPO boundary that's currently and some of the pressures and some of the information that we could gather from in there. 
Um, if you take a look there, you have all the uh, multicolored triangles on the edge of the county boundary there. Those are the inputs from the counties that are coming, uh, our neighboring county, Hockley, Lynn, uh, Gar uh, Crosby, and you know all those different counties that are right there. We have inputs from them and we have our model. However, that really doesn't tell us the type of freight flow, different type of flows that are coming in. And so we made an, a call over to the federal, uh, to the state to be able to ask them for their state model. And based off the state model, we were able then to combine that information from the state model, uh, utilizing our TransCAD uh, model and be able to bring in some state information. When you take a look at this, based off the state model inputs, and adding it to our transportation current Lubbock model, we were then able to verify that on a daily basis, we have about 18,000 to 19,000 vehicles coming from the north, going through Lubbock on I-27, and exiting to the south, we only have about 10,300. So we know there's some that are coming into Lubbock, intermingling and then bouncing back north, but there is some freight moving going north and south. With that, we also have a lot of traffic coming from Hockley County and from Clovis, hence the MPO discussion we had a little bit earlier. Um, from Hockley County, we have about 13,400 or 14,000 trips coming along 84. We have about 10,000 trips coming in from uh, 114 uh, or 114 and about 7,000 or 8,000 trips coming in along 82. Exiting towards Crosbyton, we have about 8,000 um, going along 82 and about 4,000 leaving at uh, FM 114. The interesting uh, motion, though, that is really here is when we take a look at the Clovis Highway or uh, US 84, the number is exact coming in from the northwest and exiting on the Northeast. And so we took a look at those numbers to really verify what's going on. And that's a super heavy freight movement. And so we have a lot of freight movement that are coming in through Lubbock, stopping, doing some business and continuing on. We have freight movement that's coming from the North and from the South. And we decided, well, how does that impact our traffic? And so if you take a look at that, those heavy thick lines, the thicker the line, the more volume. So as it comes in, you're seeing that the lines are pretty thin. Those are the freight movements coming into Lubbock. As it interacts with our local traffic, it gets heavier. Now, take a look at the color. If the color is black or the darker shaded colors means that the capacity is reaching that point where capacity is starting to reach a level where it's becoming congested. And so if you take a look, you have a really heavy congestion along I-27, some congestion on the, so um, on the South 289, and then congestion leaving Lubbock along US 84. And so those are really kind of important things to think about for future planning processes and what it means as freight movements increase, as traffic increases here from local development, and how those two interact. Based off of that information, I wanted to kind of bring this in. And so based off of that, um, the green cross is what we took a look at for our boundary. The pink counties that you see right there have important freight movement con uh, interaction between not only Hobbs and Clovis, but also a really heavy impact on Lubbock. And as you, again, if you take a look at the bands, the thicker the band, the heavier the freight movement is. And then the color red means that there's some improvements that need to occur to be able to help facilitate some of that freight movement. And the reason why we couldn't take a look at the larger area of the pink boxes there is because it just didn't meet the federal requirements. Those communities, they have some smaller communities. They just don't have an urban community large enough to be able to designate them to either one MPO or micro metropolitan area. But in anticipation of 10 years down the road, they might be able then to be attributed because they will have some population growth. We also anticipate that they will be attributed to one or two MPOs based off of what will happen with population growth in our neighboring state in New Mexico. And so what we are asking here is to be able to, to, be able to go out and do the public participation process and be able to outreach to our neighboring counties and bring in all five counties in anticipation that in 10 years, 
we will be taking a look at Clovis Highway and trying to bring in those neighboring counties in the pink into our MPO boundary because we would like then to be able to have that planning process in the future be underneath the Lubbock MPO and TxDOT. So that way we can kind of make sure that we make the improvements on our tech stop facilities that are needed to be able to help facilitate those freight movements in the future. And so as you can kind of take a look at there, the planning process that we did was quite extensive. We took a look at modeling processes. We took a look at DOT information that we could take a look in. We outreached to neighboring uh, states as well as neighboring districts. And so um, at this point in time, we're pretty confident uh, that uh, we would like to move forward with the larger five county boundary adjustment. And I can stand here and take any questions uh, that you may have. Okay. Mr. Judge, I'm Judge Bench. Why, um, with, with the freight traffic, what you say it is from, from the southeast, why, why was not Garza County considered? It's because um, underneath... Let me go ahead and I'll move back to the very uh, first or second slide. So part of the rules that are based off the planning boundary adjustments, uh, we have to take a look at micro and metropolitan statistical areas. And to be able to qualify underneath a micro statistical area, they have to have an urban area that are, is between 2,500 to 5,000 individuals, so any one community or any one uh, grouping of urban areas. The issue is, is in the past, you could qualify underneath, sorry, it's 5,000 individuals or 2,500 homes in any urban area, urbanized or urban census area. Um, in the past, it used to be 2,500 individuals but they took that smaller designation away. And in Garza County, that eliminated areas such as Post and other communities. And so they don't have a community currently that qualifies them to be able to meet that micro designation. In, in the future, they might. Um, uh, we're not too sure yet. It's just that the census uh, uh, requirements changed for their county and what they designated as urban and what they kept as rural. And so because of that, a lot of those smaller communities disappeared from the urban map. And so we uh, then cannot look at Garza County currently. Now, uh, if it was in conjunction with like uh, a council of governments, there's some uh, council of governments out there and MPOs that are within the council of governments. They are then able then to bring in some of those rural counties based off of the council of government uh, makeup. However, our MPO is not set up that way. And so we cannot take a look at those rural counties. Going to, your, the, going to the last slide, back then we had future. One more. That one. You've got future freight evaluation um, looking west. Why not future freight evaluation there in Garza County since we're getting a lot of traffic there? That is something that we can do, and we can go ahead and make that adjustment I, I, and do that public outreach with that. Cochrane County is pretty tiny. And I, you know, I, I, I think if, when, we look, when we look specifically at the I-27 expansion heading straight south, but we're also going to have a lot of traffic coming in there off of I-20 straight up 84. We still do. We, we are. Mm -hmm. Yes. A ton. Saw a bunch of it yesterday. We can go ahead and do that. The other county that we were kind of questioning as well is to be able to go ahead and take a look at the com um, community of Seminole. Um, just... Uh, touching right, uh, going east and west. They have a con connection into Hobbs, but that freight movement as well as that uh, community movement between Brownfield, Seminole, uh, Denver City, all the way into Lubbock, we see traffic and, and volumes going there as well. Uh, we can take a look at, uh, oh, at Garza County. Um, the one uh, 
thing that we would also maybe consider is be able to have a conversation with Midland MPO, the Odessa Midland MPO, because they do have that future connection with I-27 expansion. There's going to be some coordination between our two MPOs there um, once we make our boundary adjustment and they make theirs. Um, we'll only be one county away from each other, and so there will be some definite coordination that will have to occur there. The only reason we did not list that county as a possible expansion county there is because we want to play nice with our neighbors and to make sure that we have that conversation there in the future. And so uh, there will be some conversations there. Um, we haven't reached out to Amarillo quite yet. Um, we're just waiting to see what adjustments they want to make as well. And so in the future, there might be some conversations to the north as well. Anyone else? Judge? Madam I'm just, Chair. Mr. Warren. I got to admit, I'm confused. You, you're making a presentation on the metropolitan area boundary or the urban boundary. What is this slide? I, I, we're not, surely not talking about it dragging in Bailey County, Lamb so, County into the metropolitan area. Surely not. So this, this slide is just this, a discussion of what will happen in possibly in 10 years out after the next census. So after the next census, there's an adjustment that could occur. There's adjustment that may not occur. But we're trying to have a conversation right now on why it's important to be able to expand out to the five counties. Because based off that five county anal analysis and the boundary adjustment, the next census will have our MPO boundary including all five counties. And then based off of that, the census will make an analysis on what micro uh, designations they might give if any of those other smaller counties, rural counties, might have a community that explodes. So in 10 years, there might be in a community along the Clovis Highway that might explode. They might become 5,000 individuals and become an urban center. Well, Littlefield's already over 5,000. Yeah. Um, but there's this thing called the RPO that you're aware of, the Rural yes. Planning Organization. Yes. That's how we deal with these counties. Guards County is very active in that, Judge. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we deal with future planning through the RPO. I'm not sure what the purpose is of the MPO getting involved in that. So the MPO, with us being able to reach out and be able to help out with freight planning, um, some coordination there to be able to help make sure that they're aware of uh, future federal funds and projects, just like we do now. We, we have a, a, a good working relationship, and we're trying to make a stronger working relationship. As part of the, if we are authorized to, make, uh, to move out for the public participation process, we will uh, make a presentation at the RPO, the next RPO, concerning just the three, uh, just the five county portion. The only reason why I bring up the additional what you see in the red is because we took a look at what those freight movements were. And part of the freight movement uh, consideration for a micro and a metropolitan area is if they have any freight or business or economic ties to a neighboring MPO. That's how those micro are added in underneath the federal regulations. And so right now, part of the reason why I think some of those external counties weren't added in as a separate micro is because they weren't touching an MPO boundary that made sense for that tie. And so they didn't take a look at that from a larger federal standpoint. With this adjustment here, the federal uh, adjustment uh, will, or the future federal evaluation might take a look at that. And they might say there is a tie, they might not. They might not agree. And that is completely um, fine. And that is up to them, but that's just a planning process that we're taking a look at. We do take a look out as a 20-year process. Because we take a look out as a 20-year process as mandated underneath the federal regulations, we have to take a look at things like freight and uh, economic development that might tie into an MPO and have impact to their infrastructure. Um, that was part of the reason why I took a look at all those freight movements and added them back into our model and did a flow model test to be able to say, okay, with this additional freight movement coming in, what does it do to our MPO infrastructure, our roadways within the Lubbock MPO? And as you can kind of see, within the Lubbock MPO, 
it had an impact as the freight moved in into the urban core and was either dropping off or picking up. It was causing uh, congestion. It wasn't causing severe congestion in the sense of L.A. or Dallas or New York, but it did cause congestion. It did have an impact, and that was part of the flow ban. And so that's just more of trying to take a look at the larger picture. I'm, I'm not saying today that we're going to stand up and become an MPO of 17 counties. That's not the goal. The goal is to be able to just do the planning and help coordinate that planning process for freight and impacts that will occur within the urbanized core. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? I do have one quick question. Yes. So the, the public participation is only regarding the green, and then the red is just looking 10 years out to like for consideration. It's just the, oh. what's yeah, exactly. If the green is just the public participation, that's the only thing that we're going to go out and do. The red is just as part of our mandated 20-year process. Okay. Go ahead, Jerry. Pardon. Okay. Uh, going back to the urban boundary, uh, or going back to the to the Lubbock County map. Yeah, right there. Okay. So I, I know we talked about this in May, and I just want to kind of make sure that I understood. What's in the green right now is the proposed MPO boundary. So the actual requirement based off the federal requirement, if there's anything in the purple that touches the green, we have to bring them in because it's, we have to invite them in. They don't have to accept and come in. Anything in the green is already in or will be tied into the current Lubbock MPO boundary if we went all the way back to just the urban areas. I understand. So the, basically the city of shallow water and the city of Slayton and the area of Buffalo Springs Lake and Lake Ransom Canyon. So we will would now be part of, if we approve this, will now be part of the LMPO. Is that correct? So those communities would be within the boundary of an LMPO if it was through the public participation plan and you decided to go ahead and do um, just the urbanized area. So option one, we would make an invitation to Slate in the shallow water, but not to Ransom Canyon or Buffalo Springs, because those would still be underneath the county purview since they aren't uh, over, they're not considered an urbanized area. If the MP LMPO decided to go ahead and make an invitation out to those communities, we could, but that would be at your direction, and it would just to be to invite them. Um, they also don't have to participate at the highest level. So say Slate and, and Shallow Water said, we would like to be within the planning process, but we don't want to participate on the policy board. We'd just like to send an engineer or a staff member to the TAC committee. That's something that they could do and, and be part of that process as well. They could also state, we understand that we're within the MPO boundary. We don't want to participate. And at that point in time, that would be perfectly fine and legal. We would just say thank you. And then in the next 10-year process, if they still qualified and we would have to make that invitation, we would go and make that invitation and then give them another opportunity down the road. Anyone else? Well, for today's purposes, we're basically just accepting your analysis and giving you the okay to uh, have public participation. Involved. Yes. Participation. Yep. Public comment. That's all we're doing. Uh, there's no decision being made today. All we're doing is going out to the public and letting them know the analysis that we did, uh, some of the information that we gathered, and trying to see uh, if there's any other information that we missed. And then once we're done with the public participation, we'll go back to the TAC, give them an opportunity to be able to review the information that was received and gathered, and then come back to the policy committee with some additional information. Anything further? If not, I call for a motion to accept this analysis and give the authorization uh, for the go ahead for the public involvement. Second. Have a, a motion and a second. All those in favor by the sign of aye. Aye. Those opposed, same sign. Thank you. We are now to item number 10 to discuss and take appropriate action regarding paperless transportation policy. 
And I know this was something that I indicated. I knew that Mr. Uh, Massengale would be excited about. <laughs> Anything, all things digital. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Uh, well, this one's an easy one. Uh, basically, um, a lot of our regional uh, partners and regional uh, planning organizations around the area, in including uh, City Bus, are going paperless. And so, um, because of that, uh, we're, we went to the Transportation Advisory Committee and asked them if they would like to consider going paperless. And now, um, based off of their uh, their acceptance and their, their guidance and, and their decision, uh, we will be going paperless as of the August meeting for the Transportation Advisory Committee. Because of that, we're now standing before you to be able to ask uh, what you would like us to do for the Transportation Policy Committee. If you would like us to go ahead and move forward with uh, as, as is, with paper uh, and email, and having kind of a dual system where we provide both to you, if you would like us to be able to go ahead and move forward where we just uh, move forward with a paperless system, and if you do not have a digital uh, means of, of viewing that, we would provide a, a tablet or something to be able to utilize at the meetings. Uh, we would then uh, provide one or two printed copies for visitors who would come uh, and, and to be able to make sure that they had something to be able to hold and view as needed. Um, but we would like to have a discussion here today and to be able to see uh, what your um, feelings are about that. And there are some cost savings uh, attributed with going paperless. And we do provide uh, some large packets from time to time. This one here is a smaller packet. Uh, last year in April, we had a packet that was over 150 pages thick. It was just a really heavy packet. Um, it takes some staff time to be able to put those together as well. Um, we, but we'd be happy to do however you'd like. Thank you. Mr. Massingale. Thank you for bringing it up for our discussion. Uh, Madam Chair is correct. I've advocated for this for years. I converted a school board this way. I've also converted a city council. Uh, I'd make a motion to approve. All righty. Could I get that in writing, please? <laughs> when, when would you Can like to send it digitally on my iPad? <laughs> When would you like that to occur? Uh, would it be? October 1. OK. We have a, a motion and a second to transfer to di all things digital beginning October the 1st, as recommended by the TAC. Uh, all those in favor, say aye. Aye. Those opposed, say sign. Thank you, Mr. Massinger. You want another one. All right, item 11, discuss and take appropriate action regarding oh, a scheduled meeting for next month, July the 20th. So as I mentioned earlier in an earlier uh, presentation, the Transportation Advisory Committee has already canceled their July meeting. As such, uh, we have also taken action concerning uh, a TIP STIP adjustment and amendment and as such, we don't anticipate having any additional information to bring forward to you in a July meeting. So we are standing here asking you uh, for your direction on whether you would like us to go ahead and post and cancel the July meeting, or if you would like us to come and, and gather up some additional information for a July meeting and to be able to hold that as has been posted in the annual uh, listing. Judge Parrish. Chair, I... I would just I would defer to, to staff on looking to see if we actually needed a meeting to adjust the tip at that point and then notify us at least two weeks prior. Okay. Okay. Can I take that uh, as a just a recommendation? Just a staff recommendation. Okay. A recommendation to staff. Thank you. Anyone else have comments or anything different? Okay, we'll um, give proper notice two weeks out um, if we are going to cancel or have a meeting, and we'll, we'll let you know uh, the week of July 4th. Thank you. Digitally. Digitally. <laughs> Digitally. <laughs> 
All righty. I'm going to have to get, get, have to get us to the end. Uh, <laughs> item number 12, our reports. There's only a couple things, so uh, we can get those done. So thank you. We're, we're hitting the tail end of the, of the meeting, and I managed not to come off the rails too bad. So I'm grateful for your guidance and your help and your patience, but uh, we're, we're on the tail end here. Uh, I'd just like to give an expenditure report as well as a financial report real quick. Um, based off of our expenditures, uh, we are sitting really well. We've uh, expended about, we're about halfway through the, uh, the fiscal year. We've expended only about 40% of our, of our uh, funds. We're about halfway through, and so we're sitting uh, pretty well. We should be able to uh, complete this fiscal year without any issues. Um, from an expenditure standpoint, we've... Uh, been uh, approved to be able to spend 360979 We've only expended up to this point $185,640. Um, from a revenue standpoint, we've been able to collect 156000 and that's up through April, and so we're on a good pace to be able to get those uh, revenues collected back through, and so we will have those probably in July. We'll probably be squared up again. And so right now we're sitting really well. We're uh, about uh, 253,000 uh, revenue over expenditures for the year. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, sir. All right. The last thing I'd like to uh, indicate there, for those who uh, might not have heard, um, we had a retirement uh, in May, and so Daryl West uh, Moreland retired in between your last meeting and this meeting, and so we do have an opening in the MPO currently right now with that retirement, and so we're in the process of backfilling our GIS analyst position, and so we will be doing that here shortly. Um, hopefully by either July or August, we'll have a body here to introduce to you, and uh, we'll, we'll go through that process and then come forward and introduce them at the next meeting that, uh, as appropriate. Thank you so much for letting us know. Anything on that? I don't have anything else, uh, so we are adjourned.